did, a uh, very vivid memory. And so uh, to those people of, of my generation, uh, when Neil Armstrong took that first small step in 1969, uh, we all believed it was the first step on a stairway to the stars. Uh, and, of course, my feelings about space exploration were very much shaped by my experiences in the 1950s and 1960s when it looked like almost anything might be possible with enough application of science and technology. And so I dug out uh, this uh, futuristic picture of what a moon base might be like, and that was in 1962. So uh, I don't know if there are any fellow Brits in the audience here, but uh, for us, our ideas were very much shaped by the Eagle Comet and the inventions of Dan Dare. Uh, and the great thing about Dan Dare, as he whizzed around uh, from planet to planet, uh, acting out all sorts of adventures, uh, was that if he ran out of fuel, in his rocket ship, he just had to stop by somewhere at a refueling station. Uh, his ship was called Anastasia, uh, and he uh, inevitably had a young uh, cadet colleague who had a smaller version called Minastasia. Uh, and so it was just a simple matter of, of refueling, and off you went for the next adventure. Uh, and so I suppose we all thought, well, you know, it's dead easy. Uh, uh, rocket uh, travel is going to be like uh, aircraft flight, you just need uh, to build more of them and have enough refueling stations, and away you go, you can explore the universe. Uh, well then, uh, in the 1960s, I became uh, a physicist and uh, learned the laws of physics, and I realized that there were issues uh, with this. Uh, uh, this type of setup with Anastasia clearly is ludicrous. Um, fortunately, these problems were solved in 1968 uh, when uh, Star Trek uh, introduced the concept of the warp drive. Uh, and um, I'll, I'll come back to that in a, in a few moments. Uh, meanwhile, uh, Stanley Kubrick uh, was producing his uh, movie based on Arthur C. Clarke's uh, story, uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey. And this, uh, remember, was just one year before the Apollo, first Apollo landing. And so it really did look like if the first small step for a man uh, by Neil Armstrong uh, really was a first small step that within a few decades we really might be dealing with major uh, space colonization. So this uh, was the situation in 1969 with a lot of promise lying ahead. But as the, the previous speaker alluded to, uh, we all know that the Apollo program was really uh, an appendage of the arms race driven largely by uh, the fear that the Soviet Union would uh, seize the high frontier, gain the technological edge on Earth and in space. Uh, and that's what pushed the dollars into the program. Uh, and eventually, uh, it ran out of dollars, and the Apollo program ran out of steam, and uh, NASA has uh, gone on to do wonderful things in planetary exploration. But in terms of uh, manned space flight, uh, the pinnacle seems to be the international space station. So here we are decades later, um, having gone uh, no farther into space than uh, the distance from Washington to New York. I think if I've done the maths right. Uh, and so uh, the International Space Station, uh, I'm sure the people who work on it and with it are very proud of it, uh, but in terms of, uh, of going somewhere, uh, it's not very exciting. It just goes round and around and it gets resupplied from time to time, and it's, it's not going to go anywhere else. And so the question is, uh, in, in my mind, back in the 60s, and I think that of many other commentators, it, it was going to be a one, two, three. First the moon, then Mars, then the stars. Um, and that's the way it looked at the time. And so if we're going to lift our vision beyond the moon, where do we lift it to? A case can be made that we... Uh, should uh, resume manned exploration of the moon or perhaps uh, near-Earth asteroids, something of that sort. But I think what really captures the imagination probably of everybody in this room, but the general public as well, is the possibility of going to Mars. Uh, well, as uh, Bob Zubrin has uh, remarked, uh, one of the compelling reasons to go to Mars is it's the second place, safest place in the solar system. 
Now, you might be forgiven uh, from thinking that when you look at a typical picture, this one taken by Viking, of the, of the Martian surface. It is a freeze-dried uh, desert uh, beneath a pitifully thin atmosphere bathed in ultraviolet radiation. Uh, it's very cold, very dry. Um, but it is not uh, totally hopeless by any means. And the main reason I say that is because Mars has the one crucial feature that human beings uh, certainly need wherever they go, and that is liquid water. Now, this isn't a picture of liquid water. It's a picture of a teardrop-shaped island sculpted by ancient uh, Martian floods. Uh, the uh, thinking is that uh, most of the um, fluvial features on Mars were produced uh, not by uh, gentle rain and winding Mississippis, uh, but by catastrophic uh, outpourings of liquid water uh, in the far past. Uh, and we see here the way it has uh, scoured its way across the Martian landscape to produce these, uh, these features. Now, you'll be familiar with all this stuff because you can get it from the NASA website and the European Space Agency website. Beautiful, beautiful pictures. And it's interesting that Mars is currently being mapped to a degree of resolution that's better than the Earth. And so uh, all this stuff is out there. Uh, just assembled a few things. Um, again, sh this, uh, these pictures just showing uh, that at some time in the past, water has uh, scoured the surface. This, um, for many years, was in some doubt. Uh, there are alternative theories about how some sort of carbon dioxide slurry might reproduce some of these features. But uh, the evidence has slowly firmed over the years that the majority are due to water. What you see here is a sort of tributary system. And, uh, and this is a very uh, famous picture of um, uh, what appears to be uh, like the Grand Canyon of Mars, uh, at least to, to a certain extent etched by water. Um, and th this uh, picture here is still controversial. Well, the picture's not controversial, but the interpretation is still controversial. Uh, my uh, uh, colleague, uh, uh, Phil Christensen at Arizona State University uh, is, um, has been involved in Mars missions all his career, uh, and he's skeptical that these features uh, down this escarpment are produced by water outflow. Uh, but one possibility uh, is that they are, that there is uh, water about 200 meters uh, beneath the surface, liquid water in briny reservoirs, which if uh, uh, liberated in some way will run down the slopes. Uh, so that may or may not be produced by water. If it is, then this water uh, will have flowed quite recently. All the other pictures are uh, very ancient. It's another feature of the same type. Uh, one way in which these, uh, this could be produced uh, not from, uh, from uh, outflows, uh, just to, to br briefly talk about uh, Christensen's theory, is that uh, from time to time, the, I'm sure you know that the uh, obliquity of Mars uh, varies chaotically. It doesn't have a large moon uh, such as Earth has to stabilize it. And so there can be very great climatic excursions over time scales of a million years or so. And if it turns out that the, one of the poles faces the sun, if it gets a very high obliquity, then this can uh, create uh, evaporation of carbon dioxide, a thickening of the atmosphere, massive greenhouse warming, uh, and deposition of probably snow and that you could have a snow-covered escarpment like this, and then when the snow uh, eventually uh, melts at the base, it can create those features. Uh, perhaps that's how it's, uh, how it's caused. Uh, and this is a nice one because it shows uh, something like frost. Uh, I don't know if it's completely determined that this is water frost or, or water ice or uh, carbon dioxide or a mixture of two. Um, but anyway, the upshot of all this uh, rather rambling introduction is that it does seem uh, clear that uh, liquid water once existed on Mars and is present, uh, that water is present in the polar caps and in the permafrost uh, even today. So that's the crucial thing. It has uh, what is needed. It also has carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, has minerals uh, to make things, and several of the talks later in this conference will deal with um, that sort of uh, literally down-to-earth technology of how to extract what's needed from the Martian soil and atmosphere uh, to, in order to build things and uh, uh, create fuel and so on. Many of those pioneering ideas are due to Bob uh, Zubrin, and it's great to see that, uh, that they're being carried forward with more detailed investigations. 
So I'm going to leave that to others to talk about and dwell instead on the costs of the mission because it's quite clear, as we've seen uh, uh, successive administrations in the United States embrace Mars and then back away again, uh, that uh, at the end of the day, it's all about dollars. And this is now uh, history, what I'm showing you, as I, uh, I'm sure you know, uh, that the shuttle is now retired. Uh, and so the question is, uh, if we're stuck with old-fashioned uh, rocket propellant, it's going to be a very, very expensive mission uh, to send, say, four uh, astronauts to Mars and, uh, and bring them back again uh, and enable them to do some useful work whilst they're there. Uh, and so it all boils down at the end of the day to dollars. I wish I could say uh, that there's enough resources worldwide if we combined the efforts of NASA, ESA, the Chinese and Indian space agencies, and throw in some private contractors as well, uh, maybe it wouldn't be uh, staggeringly expensive. Uh, in fact, my entire take on the cost of space missions has been completely renormalized by uh, my experience with the uh, bank uh, bailouts and other bailouts over the, the last few years. So now, you know, $100 billion no longer seems uh, like very much. It would buy you a modest bank, perhaps. Um, and so uh, one does have to get this in perspective, but nevertheless, it's quite clear uh, that no uh, US administration is ever going to uh, put up the money uh, to fund a return mission to Mars uh, any time in the next uh, few decades. So a lot of people pin their hopes then on alternative uh, propulsion systems. Uh, there is a NASA breakthrough propulsion physics project, and later in this, uh, in this uh, conference, we're going to hear about some imaginative efforts uh, to get, as it were, more bang from your buck. Uh, there are several talks, including three um, by the uh, splendidly named Stan Gunn. Uh, and uh, uh, no doubt uh, you'll hear more details. Uh, but uh, let me just review some of the things that, uh, that I know about. So back in the uh, 50s, uh, Freeman Dyson investigated the use of uh, thermonuclear power uh, to propel a rocket in uh, Project Orion. There's a very nice book that his son, uh, George Dyson, wrote reviewing this entire project. Uh, it was uh, laid to rest, not because uh, the physics didn't make sense, uh, Dyson is a, an accomplished physicist, uh, but because of concerns about radiation uh, safety and the nuclear test ban treaty. Uh, and the, the plan with Project Orion uh, was uh, to detonate a series of uh, nuclear bombs uh, behind the spacecraft with a, a large shield that would be ablated by the uh, high temperatures and uh, fulfill the functions of a rocket propellant. Uh, and uh, because you do get more bang for your buck with nuclear power than with chemical uh, power, uh, this looked like it could substantially cut the costs of um, launching uh, into orbit, but from orbit into uh, deep space, uh, very heavy payloads. It could still work, but I, it's uh, clearly politically uh, not feasible. Um, a thermonuclear power releases about 1% uh, of the rest mass of the uh, material, which is uh, uh, the nuclear material which is involved, um, which, is met, which is the reason why it's uh, so efficient. Uh, the ultimate in propellant is to release 100% of the rest mass. Uh, and that can come uh, if you have something which is uh, even more imaginative, the antimatter engine. So antimatter uh, was predicted by the British uh, physicist Paul Dirac in the early 1930s, uh, based on his uh, famous unification of quantum mechanics with special relativity. And the Dirac equation, for those who don't know it, it can be found on a plaque in Westminster Abbey uh, commemorating uh, Dirac's uh, life and, uh, and work. Uh, so um, antimatter uh, was predicted by Dirac in the 30s and discovered very shortly thereafter in cosmic rays. It's not science fiction. Today it's routinely made in, in particle accelerators. Uh, this is a, a particle accelerator that will be familiar to you. It's the Large Hadron Collider at the CERN lab uh, in Switzerland, well in France. It goes across the, the border, beneath the border. Uh, that's not the uh, machine that makes antimatter. Here's the antimatter machine. Um, and of course, it's made famous by the 
uh, the uh, novel of Dan Brown, Angels and Demons, a uh, little bit exaggerated, I have to say, in that novel, but the production of antimatter is real. The problem is, two problems. One is that you, to produce it, uh, it's in pitifully small quantities, uh, but secondly, uh, antimatter is unstable because when antimatter and matter encounter each other, they annihilate, and that's the reason that you get the enormous energy release, they annihilate and just uh, turn 100% of their rest mass into energy. And so storing the antimatter is really problematic. It's problematic here on Earth, not so problematic in space. So you can have a bucket full of antimatter um, uh, a meter away from the spacecraft and everything would be fine, uh, so long as you didn't have an in-course correction and bring the two of them into contact. So you have to, have to use the antimatter sparingly and in a controlled way, but this is uh, certainly possible. There's an idea that I think uh, will uh, quite literally uh, fly at some stage, and that is uh, to use uh, light uh, pressure or even the pressure of the solar wind. So light uh, exerts a pressure. Many of you will know that. Some people seem surprised to hear it because uh, uh, they don't realize that light has oomph. Well, it does. Uh, any, uh, anything that carries energy can exert a pressure. And so when light hits a mirror, it pushes the mirror slightly away from it. Uh, but it is a tiny effect, and it's um, manifested in the way that comets sprout tails. There are two tails of comets, one due to the solar wind, which is particles of, uh, or protons, uh, and the other is due to light. And so with some comets, I didn't find an appropriate picture. Some comets have two tails, one for each reason. Uh, so light pressure is a possibility, and there have been ambitious plans to have solar sails, uh, which would... Um, the force acting on these sails from, from the light pressure from the sun would be rather tiny but insistent. And so in a cumulative way, over months and years, uh, it could build up to be something quite substantial. And I think this uh, is an idea that is worth pursuing. Of course, it doesn't have a lot of sex appeal. Um, it's, uh, it would be hard to imagine that the Star Trek series would have done so well if this was the way they got around uh, the universe. Um, so what about this warp uh, drive business? Uh, uh, there certainly have been uh, uh, papers in the um, professional literature by some of my theoretical physics colleagues, just as I might say there have been papers on uh, time travel, that is, uh, traversable wormholes and closed time-like world lines. I've even written some myself. I have to say that a lot of this uh, speculation about uh, warp drives and so on um, draws in a somewhat embarrassing way from work I did in the 70s and 80s on negative energy uh, fluxes and the quantum vacuum. Uh, and uh, I have to say that I don't take uh, uh, the, the ideas uh, too seriously, but perhaps you'll be persuaded otherwise uh, later in the, uh, in the session. Uh, the, um, well, I won't get into it because it gets very technical, but, uh, but this is uh, an area, obviously, of some interest. Uh, but I do, uh, in terms of what appears in the professional literature, just like with wormholes and time travel, um, it, it could be described as a sort of recre recreational phys physics for um, bored uh, theoretical physicists. Uh, it does fulfill a function, however, which is, uh, for example, in the case of the wormholes and uh, time travel, uh, if you can have closed time like world, world lines, which is what you need to go back into the past, uh, then if, if such a thing is possible within our framework of uh, theoretical physics, uh, then it shows us something very profound about the nature of causality. And in attempts to unify physics through string theory or something like that, uh, we must be mindful of the causal structure of space-time. Uh, and if it can have uh, bizarre temporal loops, uh, just as if it can have negative energy, uh, then we need to, to know a bit about that. Um, uh, well, uh, all of this is a sort of roundabout way of saying uh, that I'm a bit skeptical uh, about the short-term prospects for some of these radically alternative uh, ideas, propulsion systems. Uh, and so I'm assuming that we are, uh, for now, stuck with uh, chemical uh, propellants. Uh, and therefore stuck with the very high cost, very high price tag that would uh, attach to uh, going uh, to Mars. Uh, and so uh, several years ago I wrote this opinion piece in the New York Times, uh, January the 15th, 2004, in which I uh, set out uh, a bold plan about going to Mars but not coming back, uh, the one-way mission that forms the title of my talk. Uh, and um, when I began discussing this idea with colleagues and friends and so on, 
uh, about a one-way mission. They looked at me as though I was mad. And then, of course, I immediately have to say this is not a suicide mission. Uh, what we're talking about here is uh, sending people to Mars. Uh, they don't come back, not because we're just dumping them there and letting them die, but because they've gone there to, to live and work and become the trailblazers of a permanent human establishment on the Red Planet. In other words, they're the, they're the first colonists. And uh, to be sure, life uh, would be uncomfortable, and to be sure, it would be probably somewhat shorter than if they remained on Earth. But I'm going to come to that in a moment. Uh, but the idea is not uh, to, um, uh, to just leave them uh, to, to, to die after a short period of time. So, some of you may or may not know, I don't know, uh, that there was uh, a, a secret uh, program for one-way missions to the moon back in the, in the 1960s. That is, that it was anticipated that the astronauts might not get back, and so they trained people uh, for, for that prospect. And then they literally would have had just a few days. So we're not talking about anything like that. Um, and the reason that I advocated it is uh, simply because uh, by cutting out the return journey, one reduces the costs very substantially. And so that this is a way of making uh, Mars exploration uh, fit within the limited uh, budgets of uh, the United States and other nations' uh, uh, space programs. Now, we're not going to see anything like this, I don't think, anytime uh, soon. Um, there's, uh, there's plenty of stuff out there on the web, uh, artists' impression of um, what a Mars colony uh, would be like. I think many of these artists were inspired by Bob's uh, uh, books and his Mars direct uh, concept and his, his one, for example. Uh, and I think uh, I could imagine uh, that this is uh, something like what an early Mars colony would look like. Uh, you would make uh, certainly uh, a lot of use of the, of the um, capsule, the landing uh, vehicle. You can't afford to throw much away when you're on Mars. You've got to really think very carefully about what you take and what you use, because everything uh, that you send there costs uh, ever more dollars. And so we can imagine a tiny little colony like this. Um, uh, now, uh, if, if uh, you can make up whatever numbers you like, but my feeling about the first uh, Mars expedition is it should consist of uh, probably four people. Uh, maybe if you want some redundancy and you can afford it, two by two, the so-called two for two uh, uh, mission configuration, that would be nice. But we're not talking about sending, uh, you know, a, a, a hundred people or even a football team. We're just uh, talking about a handful who would set up uh, a base camp, so to speak, uh, for others to follow. Now, because of the astronomical situation, it's favorable to resupply Mars every uh, two years. And as Bob has uh, taught us, you send on ahead all of the stuff that you need to survive at least until the next resupply cycle. So you know it's already there before you send the astronauts. Um, and then uh, every two years, you send the letters from home and the sandwiches and uh, I don't know what, food parcels. Uh, and, uh, and eventually, of course, more astronauts, and I'll come to that in a moment. Um, but uh, let's uh, just see some more pictures. So we've got this uh, tiny little group. They'd need a rover vehicle. That looks like a rather expensive one. I uh, would have in mind something a bit more primitive uh, and a bit lighter. But anyway, the, the upshot is that they would begin to build and build for the future. Uh, and, uh, and, and now we enter the realm of science fiction, because uh, how long is it going to take before uh, we would have a fully functioning, self-sustained city on Mars, something uh, where they uh, can get everything and manufacture everything they need, uh, something like this. Well, I would estimate several centuries, so I, you know, this is circa 3000 AD. It's not going to happen anytime soon. And one of the problems about this uh, proposal, I'll come back to it shortly, um, is that we have to assume that this strategy of opening up Mars and developing it uh, is going to remain stable over many, many political cycles. Now, there's much more uh, to being happy on Mars, uh, that is, uh, having a uh, a self-sustained colony with uh, human beings uh, working efficiently and in reasonable health, much more than just sending uh, food uh, or growing food and uh, having the technology for, for building systems. Uh, it's, uh, the, the experience of Biosphere 2 uh, was a rather sad one. Uh, the, what, what we realized is that 
you can't just put human beings in isolation. That if you're going to have a self-sustained human presence on Mars, you need more than a few uh, tomato plants or uh, lettuces or whatever they're going to eat and, and perhaps some livestock. Uh, you're going to need an entire ecosystem. And what has become clear is that the vast majority of any ecosystem is in the form of microorganisms. And so you don't just send the, you know, the plants and the animals, you've got to send the, the whole biota, uh, the, the rich uh, diversity which is necessary uh, to sustain an ecosystem without uh, it getting out of equilibrium. Uh, we don't understand yet just uh, what is necessary. For example, the, the human uh, microbiome, uh, you probably know there are more cells in your body uh, which are not you uh, than there are uh, which are you. That is to say that the uh, bacteria and archaea in your gut, for example, that fulfill a really important function. There's more, more cells uh, there than, than the cells of your body. Uh, and there are many, many species. And so this is now being investigated in some detail. So you need to take all of those along with you. Well, of course you would uh, if, um, if you send a human being. You get all that for free. Uh, but there are uh, in the soil and in the water, in the air, um, a rich network of uh, microorganisms sustaining uh, the ecosystems we're familiar with. And it just simply isn't going to work unless you have the whole thing. Now, we immediately hit a problem, uh, which I, I'm going to uh, address in a few moments, which is uh, about uh, the, the uh, contamination of Mars with terrestrial microorganisms. Uh, this has already happened. The Mars rovers, for example, were not uh, sterilized. Uh, and so, um, our, uh, the, the Planetary Protection Officer, which is uh, a, a wonderful job uh, at NASA, I uh, wanted to apply for it myself. It came due about three years ago, and I was told you had to be a US citizen. That was uh, bad news. I'm not, and you had to live in Washington. That was even worse news, so uh, I'm happy in, uh, in uh, Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, but anyway, uh, Biosphere 2 showed that you just can't sort of plonk people in a closed uh, system and hope for the best, uh, that it all goes wrong. Um, but um, let's, uh, let me just deal with the whole question uh, about the hazards associated. Uh, this is a long-term hazard. What about the short-term hazards associated with uh, a one-way mission? So many people say, oh, it's crazy. You see, who would ever volunteer for that? Well, the one thing I can tell you is that the, last, uh, the least of your worries are the volunteers. My inbox is just overflowing with people who say that they want to go, including some very distinguished scientists, I might say. Uh, and so there's no lack of uh, people who would do it, uh, for reasons that I'll come to in a moment. But in terms of uh, the risk, they say, well, who, who would accept such a risk? And NASA would never support such a risky venture. Well, as you know, uh, the riskiest part of space flight is takeoff and landing, uh, as the two shuttle dis disasters have shown us. Um, the uh, uh, exposure to radiation in space is pretty nasty as well, uh, and the zero G seems to have uh, rather unpleasant effects. Well, all of these things are cut in half by staying on Mars. I'm not saying that there aren't uh, G issues and radiation issues on Mars, but they're easily dealt with. Uh, but um, already, by not returning, uh, you, are, you are halving the risk from these uh, riskiest uh, aspects. Um, the, um, uh, of course, the life expectancy of any astronaut who goes to Mars is going to be reduced anyway, whether you go there and come back, but if you stay there, of course it's going to be reduced. It's going to be reduced because you won't have access to world-class medical facilities, but then nor does 95% like of, uh, of the people on Earth. Uh, so you're no worse off than, than they are now. Um, the, uh, Rigors of living in a, in a cramped environment uh, are obviously going to take their toll. But remember that, the, as, again, as Bob Zubrin has pointed out, the uh, explorers of Antarctica uh, and other difficult to get to places uh, put up with uh, e equivalent hardships and, uh, and didn't complain about it. Uh, there are people who uh, voluntarily, they pay, in fact, uh, to do crazy things like ballooning around the world or sailing blindfolded, single-handed uh, around Antarctica, I don't know. People do get up to all sorts of stunts and they do it in the name of sport and fun and often get rescued at the taxpayer's expense, I might say. Uh, so there's no, no lack of people who are prepared to engage in, in risky things. Um, but uh, for me, the primary purpose of going to Mars is scientific. I'm going to outline some of the reasons in a moment. 
so supposing uh, we, uh, I should just say that it would make sense to send astronauts whose life expectancy is not too great anyway. Uh, and I would say, um, uh, say if it, their life expectancy is 10 years uh, and it's shortened to five years, I don't think that's a great tragedy. So somebody might be uh, 75 and live to 80 instead of 85, or 70 and live to 75 instead of 80. I don't think anybody would think that this is uh, deeply unethical. So you wouldn't be sending young people. Uh, not in my view, I think you shouldn't send young people. Um, how do you uh, maintain the cost of this base once you've got it set up? Well, there are all sorts of ways of um, augmenting the contributions that might come from space agencies. Uh, the discoveries you might make could have patents attached to them. Uh, the television rights would be worth a lot, television film rights. You could sell Mars bonds, like people sell Greek uh, bonds at the moment. Um, or land titles, uh, we could imagine uh, some system there that would, uh, would fund the, uh, at least the area of the base. And of course philanthropy, and I think philanthropy is a big point. Um, if you said, uh, we're collecting money, imagine knocking on somebody's door, we're collecting money uh, to, for a mission to Mars uh, in 20 years time and they're going to stay on Mars for three months and come back and they may come back with all sorts of interesting stuff. I don't think anybody's going to be putting putting money into the, the little box. But if we've got a tiny colony on Mars, and you say, uh, we need to keep that going. This is an adventure on behalf of all mankind. Uh, you know, please give generously. Then I think you'll find at Christmas time, um, along with the other charities, there'll be the Mars Base um, Support Fund. Uh, and there'll be people out there doing that, and, and you put $10 in thinking, yeah, we can't let those people just, uh, just wither away now. This is a great thing. To, to support. So once you've got it going, the psychological effect of the maintenance costs, although the cumulative maintenance costs over decades might be much more than a return mission to Mars, it's much easier to get people to part with their, their money. So why do we want to do it? Why should we want to go to Mars in the first place? Apart from all the people here thinking it's a really cool idea, yeah, sure, those of us who were brought up uh, uh, with the diet of Dan Dare, I think it is a good idea. Um, but there are more sobering reasons why we might consider it. And one of these is something could go horribly wrong here on Earth. So my uh, old friend Martin Rees, now Lord Rees, uh, formerly the uh, president of the Royal Society and still Astronomer Royal, uh, wrote a book a few years ago called Our Final Hour. I think it was called Our Final Century here. Um, but anyway, uh, in it he lists a whole lot of reasons why um, Earth could be seriously endangered, not just um, uh, resulting in, uh, uh, in a few deaths, but uh, perhaps the end of our civilization. Uh, and um, let me whiz through a few of these. One, one of them, of course, is well known. It's the threat of impact on the Earth's surface from asteroids and comets. There's rubble left over from the formation of the solar system, and everybody knows that uh, from this stuff rains down on the planets. In fact, the top right there is the supposed, mo <coughs> supposed moon-forming impact, which occurred just after uh, the solar system formed. Uh, that was like the granddaddy of them all, but uh, this uh, bombardment has continued. It was particularly severe up until about uh, 3.8 billion years ago, but it's never gone away completely. Uh, as you know, the, the dinosaurs probably met their end with uh, an impact of a 20 kilometer sized object 65 million years ago. Uh, and so uh, these impacts do occur from time to time. Um, the, for those who are interested, uh, you'll know, of course, of Meteor Crater. I can recommend it as a, a place to see if you're uh, coming to Phoenix at any time or think you're going to the Grand Canyon. Do check out Meteor Crater as well. It's about a mile across. Um, and uh, it was made, I think, about 50,000 years ago. This impactor would have been something about the size of a large house or a small office block, not very large by um, impact uh, standards. Uh, and these um, types of events occur pretty often. This is an impact crater that I visited in Australia, Wolf Creek. Um, and it's easy, that's an older one. You see it's filled in with um, uh, soil. Uh, the, these impact craters require about uh, 10 megatons of uh, explosive uh, to, to form. And so we're talking about 10 megaton explosion, which is what you get from an impactor 
the size of a house that's uh, screaming in at about 20 or 30 kilometers per second, which is pretty typical of the impact velocities of these uh, objects. And so it's the kinetic energy that does it. It's the speed, not so much the mass. Um, and uh, there's some rough and ready statistics about how often these uh, impacts occur, but uh, once every century or two seems to be the case. The last well-known one was the Tunguska event in 1908, which flattened trees for hundreds of square kilometers, though mercifully, being a remote area, very few people were killed. Now, in the great global scale of things, uh, these are just uh, pinpricks. Uh, this doesn't spell the end of civilization by any means. Uh, but in the longer term, and if we're thinking millennia, uh, there's always a chance that we're going to be faced with a big impact and maybe uh, of dinosaur destroying dimensions. And then we we'll need Bruce Willis, of course, to, uh, to sort something out. Unfortunately, the, the strategy that Bruce Willis uh, used is a, a silly one, and also the, in the movie Deep Impact, uh, this is not the way to go. In fact, um, uh, tracking where the killer asteroids are is relatively straightforward. Figuring out what to do about it is a much tougher proposition. And we may simply have to accept the fact that there will be uh, a, a stupendous explosion. It's an interesting statistic. There's about one in a million chance, if you want to know, that uh, in any given year, uh, there, there will be an impact um, by a one kilometer size object uh, that's smaller than the Bruce Willis one, but still enough to kill a billion people. They don't all die from the impact itself, but from the uh, effect of forest fires, crop failures, uh, economic collapse, mayhem, uh, tsunamis, and, and so on. Uh, it adds up to about a billion people, which means that there's, uh, if you put in the numbers, if uh, there are any actuaries in the audience, um, a, billion, a one in a million chance per year of a billion people dying is an expectation of death of 1,000 per year, which is about the same as from airline disasters. So that uh, leads to the striking claim that a randomly chosen uh, person is just as likely to die from a cosmic impact as from an airline disaster. That doesn't mean that that applies to people in this room. We fly more often, I certainly do, than uh, your average uh, human being, but that's an arresting statistic. So uh, that's one possible reason. In my view, it's not the, the um, most likely way in which there would be a collapse of civilization or even the annihilation of our species. Uh, more likely is that there would be some uh, sort of pathogenic organism that would sweep the planet, like in the I Am Legends movie and many others that have uh, gone before it, uh, I particularly like the uh, TV series in Britain called The Survivors in the 1970s. Uh, and this uh, could happen because of either some engineered microorganism escapes from the lab, a uh, well-known scenario, or it could be some uh, just the product of evolution. Uh, uh, so, for example, the, uh, the Tasmanian devils, I'll just give a contemporary example, funny little things that used to, well, that still live in Tas Tasmania, they used to live on the mainland of Australia as well, are being wiped out because there is a communicable cancer uh, of the face that they get from biting and scratching. Uh, and it's uh, a, a particularly um, nasty one that is, it turns out, look, I'm not gonna get into the uh, molecular biology, it just turns out that because of the low genetic diversity, they're particularly susceptible. But the point is that at any given time, uh, there could be a microorganism or, or uh, some mutation that would, some disease that would spread like wildfire uh, and finish us off. Uh, and so the Mars colony is, of course, uh, in a perfect, uh, would be in a perfect position to act uh, like a lifeboat, keeping uh, the flame of our culture alive and maybe keeping the species alive until Earth recovered. Uh, you can make up your own scenario. There's a nuclear war, of course, is the, uh, the old one. There's global warming. Um, and there are even more prosaic things. These are the dramatic things we all think about, you know, really sort of uh, uh, movie-making stuff. Um, but very often, the, the really dangerous things uh, don't make good uh, television. For example, did you know that more people die in the United States from heat than from any other natural disaster or natural uh, occurrence? Well, maybe if you live in Texas or Arizona, uh, you could believe that. Although I think the people who live in Texas and Arizona don't usually die from the heat because they know how to cope with it. But it's an extraordinary thing. But of course, it doesn't make good television, so you don't see this. Um, it could be, if you want a contemporary example, bang up to date, if you want to take uh, the national debt uh, from the United States. Uh, uh, it, it could be uh, global economic collapse. We assume that the world's economy just goes on getting better and better with some hiccups, some speed bumps on the way. Uh, so this is a, a non-linear 
uh, dynamical system that nobody understands, obviously, otherwise uh, they do better. The politicians certainly don't, the economists don't seem to understand it. Uh, and uh, I like to liken the global economy to uh, the ecology of a rainforest. Uh, it's a lot of interconnected components, and we know from studying these dynamical systems, you, you can have huge excursions, you can have sudden species extinctions, for example, or plagues. These things are a natural part of the internal dynamics, which we don't understand. If this applies to the world economic system, uh, we could have massive excursions there as well, without anybody being anybody's fault. It could be just intrinsic to the dynamics of the system. And you could have, uh, as it were, economic extinction. So it just will be the collapse of civilization and, and all of the things we come to take for granted. The whole system will break down, not because of an external shock like a, an asteroid impact, but because of the intrinsic instability of the internal dynamics. So it's all very gloomy. But if we, of course, if we've got this uh, base on Mars, then it's not uh, totally the end for humanity. Um, I should say that uh, from my own point of view, I think that the main motivation to go to Mars is not just uh, as an insurance policy against uh, global extinction, uh, it is to do science. And what interests me uh, particularly uh, is the possibility of uh, life on Mars. And uh, why do we think that? Well, uh, in addition to liquid water, Mars has volcanoes. In fact, the Olympus Mons is the biggest volcano in the solar, volcano in the solar system. And um, volcanoes uh, or internal uh, planetary heat plus water leads to the possibility of hydrothermal cycling of water, hydrothermal systems, like those found in the deep ocean volcanic trenches here on Earth, where many astrobiologists believe uh, life uh, first became established. And so it looks like in the past, at least, Mars had what it takes uh, for life to get going. In fact, my own view, which I'll uh, outline very briefly, uh, is that it's quite likely life began on Mars and uh, subsequently came uh, to Earth. Now, uh, whizzing through this, uh, of course, by, is history now. Viking uh, went to Mars looking for life, didn't find any life. Not quite true. Gil Levin, who is an uh, adjunct professor in my Beyond Center at Arizona State University, uh, still thinks he found life on Mars. He uh, designed the labeled release experiment, which gave positive results at both sites. Um, and although the results are usually attributed to unknown soil chemistry, he, he's convinced that uh, he did the job that was asked of him and he found life. History will tell. Uh, but the one thing that we can be sure is that if there was life on Mars, it would certainly, uh, early on, uh, I'm thinking like, say, between uh, 3.8 and 4 billion years ago, it would certainly have come to Earth. And the reason uh, is um, because Mars takes a hit from time to time by asteroids and comets with enough force to splatter rocks around the solar system, and some of these Mars rocks comes to Earth. And right after my talk, Everett Gibson's gonna be talking about this, uh, what I call, this is the rock that made Bill Clinton famous. Uh, it's the Allen Hills meteorite with putative Martian microfossils, and you'll hear the latest evidence on that. Uh, the point, I think, that struck a lot of people at the time uh, is that uh, if uh, fossilized uh, Martians can come to Earth in a rock like this, then maybe live Martians could come as well. Uh, and uh, this is something that I've been championing uh, since the early 1990s, uh, and nobody wanted to know. They thought this was a crazy idea, and then suddenly after the Alan Hills episode, people thought, well, maybe that's plausible after all. And it's now pretty much the party line among astrobiologists that, uh, that um, uh, there's traffic of material back and forth between Earth and Mars, goes in both directions. It's easier to go from Mars to Earth than Earth to Mars because of the different uh, gravity, but uh, it certainly goes in both directions. And this means, it complicates the whole story. It means that there is an intermingling of rocks between these two planets and a likely intermingling of microorganisms. So there'll be talks later on in the conference about how this might work. Uh, so here's me holding a piece of Mars. It's always fun. Um, what about the hazards of uh, transfer? I'm not going to dwell on this because it is going to be dealt with in a later talk. Um, but all of these ha hazards, the violence of ejection, the vacuum space, the cold, particularly the radiation and the heat of re-entry, uh, um, these can all be circumvented. That is to say that there will always be some fraction of the exchange material for which this would not prove lethal. And cocooned inside a rock, maybe this size, 
uh, microorganisms could be uh, perfectly happy in space for a very long period of time. Uh, the uh, freeze-dried uh, uh, vacuum cold conditions would be perfect for preservation. They'd be shielded from most of the radiation, and the heat of re-entry might be rather minor uh, for reasons you're going to hear about. Uh, so all this raises uh, the sort of grisly prospect that the next Martian meteorite might wipe us out, the killer plague from the red planet, uh, and uh, likewise, if uh, humans go to Mars, are they going to be uh, infected by some Martian pathogen that would wipe them all out? Well, I think that is not a serious threat for the simple reason that, as I've explained, these two planets have been exchanging rocks and any microorganisms those rocks might have contained throughout their, their history. So that here we are going in the, in the other direction. So Earth has already contaminated Mars. Mars has already contaminated Earth, um, which is good news in a way uh, if you're intent on a Mars exploration or establishing a base on Mars, uh, because uh, if it's true that these two biosystems have already become intermingled, we don't have to worry too much about destroying any indigenous Martian biota that we might want to preserve. But on the other hand, uh, if the, uh, the life story in the solar system has Earth and Mars tangled up, uh, it complicates the answer to the question that we uh, really want to know, uh, which is, has life started in the solar system more than once? So if we go to, to Mars and find life there, I don't think we're going to, uh, whatever Gill says, I don't think we're going to find it on the surface. I think it's, it's probably going to be deep down. Uh, and so that means um, uh, doing the expensive way of drilling down maybe a kilometer or two and extracting material from the permafrost or doing it the cheap way, which is with a nuclear explosion and cratering the surface. It's another whole story, which uh, people uh, don't like that idea. Uh, but, that's, uh, but you could do it. Uh, but anyway, one way or the other, what if we find this life? Well, if it's the same life, then for my money, uh, it just uh, means life started on Mars and came to Earth or possibly the other way around, but I think it's more favorable in that direction. Um, or, of course, it could have started somewhere else entirely and colonized both planets. What we really want to know, though, uh, is it's a different life on Mars. Is it so different that it represents life 2.0, that is, a, a separate genesis, a separate tree of life, an independent origin. Uh, and that would uh, be by far the best um, from the point of view of the consequences. It would show that life uh, began independently on the two planets, uh, and therefore the universe has intrinsically bio-friendly laws, which is a sort of quasi-religious statement uh, having to do with the nature of the universe and our uh, place within it. And I think these are uh, the really profound questions that we like to tangle with. I've got um, 10 minutes left to speak, but I want to allow time for questions. I just want to throw in one of the things I've been doing in my astrobiology research in the recent years is pushing the idea that we may not even have to go to Mars to find a second genesis, a second sample of life. Uh, and I'm not talking about synthetic biology. We make it here in a lab on Earth. That's not good enough. I'm saying there could be a shadow biosphere right here on Earth of radically alternative life. That is life that is so different biochemically from known life uh, that it would represent a separate origin. And this uh, radically alternative life would still be microbial, or we would have found it, but that's okay. The vast majority of life on Earth, as I've explained, is microbial. Uh, and we've only just scratched the surface of the microbial biosphere. Uh, so I'm part of a research program which is, going, which is out there looking for uh, shadow life or shadow biosphere that is looking for a second sample of life right here on our home planet under our noses or even in our noses. Uh, we could find that um, genuinely alien microorganisms could be intermingled with the microorganisms that are all around us. You, and you can't tell by looking what they're made of. You've got to delve into their innards. Uh, and, and the techniques which are customized to, uh, by microbiologists to investigate microbial life um, are customized to life as we know it. If you go looking for A, you'll of course find A and not B. So I think it's entirely possible that there is a shadow biosphere on Earth. I think we could find it within 10 years if we really uh, know where to look. And it could be that this shadow biosphere is uh, uh, a separate genesis of life here on Earth. That is, life started twice on Earth and not at all on Mars, or it could be started on both Earth and Mars, and what we're dealing with is a, um, a Martian import still surviving as a shadow biosphere here on Earth, uh, or the other way around, or any, any mix and match of those scenarios. So we don't know how to find it first, because it may not be there. But the point I want to make is this, and this is my final point, that 
if we find that life has happened in the universe more than once, uh, twice is good enough. If it's it would be inconceivable that, that we'd have a universe this big and life would happen twice. It may happen once, maybe that life is a freak, bizarre aberration, unique to Earth. Maybe, oh, I think we can't say otherwise, maybe that, it's a, uh, that life is a unique freak. Or it could be that the universe is teeming with it. I don't think an in-between position is very likely. And so if we just find one more sample of life on Mars, on Earth, uh, and, and probably Mars is the most likely uh, within the solar system, Mars or Earth, uh, then that uh, suffices to make the point that the emergence of life from non-life is something built into the laws of nature and not a freak accident. Uh, and uh, then the step from life of some sort to intelligent life, of course, there's still many steps involved in that, and that could be another sequence of very rare events. But nevertheless, the hardest part uh, for getting intelligent life in the universe is the first step, non-life to life. That's the one where the error bars are biggest. At least we understand the mechanism of how life goes from microbes to intelligent beings. It's called Darwinian evolution. We may not be able to predict from microbes that there will be intelligent life, but at least we understand the mechanism. We have no idea of the mechanism that turned non-life into life. So the error bars there are enormous. Find one more sample and it removes that obstacle entirely and therefore opens the way to addressing the question that I think uh, probably grabs the greatest number of members of the public, which is the question, are we alone in the universe? I'm going to stop there. Thank you. Happy to take questions, yes. So, is it on already? I've got a question regarding your uh, slide on life, origin of life uh, on Mars, or then Earth, Earth and Mars, or somewhere else. Right. Has anybody addressed that from a molecular clock standpoint? You know, we, we, in uh, paleontology, they go back, look at genetic differences, say these lines diverged so many millions of years ago. If you look at the archaea, the bacteria, eukarya, all that, shouldn't we be able to look at a molecular clock and give an estimate of when life started? Uh, that's right. If it started before, if it started 8 billion years ago, then it ought to right. come from somewhere else. No, you're absolutely right. And if you do that, uh, what you find is that um, you trace back the, the known branches on the tree of life. Uh, the clocks are not very good, but sort of to three and a half to four billion years ago, and as Carl Sagan pointed out many years ago, this is sort of uncomfortably short time scale, given that the bombardment abated only about 3.8 billion years ago on Earth. And so what it means is already about 3.5 billion years ago, the, the Pilbara Hills in Western Australia have um, evidence that life was firmly established, whole ecosystem was established. So it's a rather uncomfortable window, and one way of extending that window is to have life start earlier on Mars. Mars was slightly more favorable because uh, all sorts of reasons, the bombardment was less, uh, it was just as severe, well, it still took its fair share of hits, but there were less hits in total because of the lower surface area. And because of the lack of a global ocean, you didn't get a superheated steam sterilization scenario that you got here on Earth. So some reasons think that Mars was a better place for life to be. Um, and, uh, and there's another argument due to Brandon Carter, his so-called doomsday argument, which uh, uh, looks at the number of uh, very improbable steps that may have led up to human beings. Uh, and there seem to be about six of them. And that first step looks to be very short if it's to have taken place here on Earth. So there are some philosophical arguments and some scientific arguments. They're not very compelling, though, I have to say, at this stage. Yeah. Yep. There seems to be quite a range of, of uh, varieties of this one way to Mars concept. And some of the extreme versions of it was where you send just one or maybe three people to Mars, and then they sort of hang on. They have just a very small amount of supplies, and they can't really do anything, oh, yes. so they just survive there. No, 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 no. so and I should have emphasized. I, that, I think, be scientists. that version of the concept, I think, would actually be deleterious because one people would lose interest in the people because they, they wouldn't be doing anything serious, like no, building no, no. a real exploration and science space, and then there would be the depressing aspects of the, lo the loneliness 
and the fact that they were really just existing. So I'm 100% in favor of people going there one way as long as it's a robust mission where you have continuing access to Mars and where new people are continuing right. to arrive and where you can do something. Right, I know, I agree entirely. And I sort of skipped a little bit rapidly over that, but I said I thought that what you should do is to send uh, aging scientists. So they do science. You see, they'd be like the proverbial kids in the candy store. They would be doing world-class science every day. And that's the motivation for all the, the people I know that have uh, volunteered want to go there to do science. So these people would still be publishing. There'd be an email communication with their peers of the usual way. Don't think they could collect the Nobel Prize because you've got to go to uh, Sweden to get it. But, yeah, but you know, they, they would go there to do science and in particular, to, in my view, to study any possible Mars uh, biology. That's what I think is the, is the great thing. Um, so I agree entirely. No, we just, just don't want to st stick people there and, and say, well, have a good time. Uh, they've got to do something. Yes, next question. Um, I don't want to argue with any of your points, I'm but the fact is there is a new game-changing nuclear process theory called the widom larsen theory. It's based on uh, nuclear synthesis, and uh, you get back 700% of the uh, energy you put in in the form of heat. And uh, mm. also, you know, tra <clears throat> transmutations occur with unnatural isotope ratios, which shows that it it has to be a nuclear process. Uh, there have been many experiments done over the last 20 years that have this, had this result, and this uh, theory ex explains the results of those experiments. Right. I, I'm sure there are many exotic uh, potential technologies out there. And just as a general comment, I'm not familiar with this particular one, is that uh, the difficulty is the development time uh, which they take uh, is, of course, many decades. And I think we're all anxious to see something happen before then. So I think if it's going to happen, it's going to have to happen with maybe slightly improved efficiency uh, uh, chemical rockets. But okay, uh, whilst a, we wait this for the longer This is a game-changing technology which will not take decades to implement. Well, I look forward to seeing the game change. All Thank right. you. Before we go to Mars with crews that are going to be drilling down to the ice and trying to find a water table and, the, and possible biosphere, one mission that has not been discussed as a needed scientific uh, engineering mission is a Mars orbiter with reconnaissance instruments, remote sensing capability, probably decimeter or tens of meter wavelengths, radio frequency remote sensing to try and sense the heat flow of the planet. Well, we got all that at the moment. All that so uh, that, stuff so is that in So that we can look for Mars. areas of thin cryosphere right. where the water table is near the surface. And I have not seen this discussed are the engineering requirements of such a mission. Right. No, no, they, it, I mean, it needs this, uh, to be looked into. But yeah, both, uh, both NASA and the European Space Agency have instrumentation in orbit around Mars investigating precisely these things, like the distribution of water and the heat flow from the planet. And a lot of this stuff is fairly well understood, but you're quite right. You want to go somewhere where the water is going to be easy to get at. Um, and so site selection is really important. If you're interested in finding life, site selection, you, you want to look for hydrothermal, hydrothermal systems. I first got interested in this subject at a conference in London in uh, the early 1990s about looking for hydrothermal systems on Mars. So that, that was my entree into the entire field. Okay, I think I'd better sit down and shut up, haven't I? Everett, it's your turn. Okay.